Welcome everyone to our virtual session for parents and the public to provide feedback on high school scenarios. My name is Karen Drummond and I'm the manager of community engagement. We'll start this evening with some introductions and then I'll pass it over to Joanne Pittman, Superintendent School Improvement for some welcoming remarks. This particular session is for the what we were calling the Northeast group of schools, which in, includes the six schools listed here. I want to mention that we have called this grouping of schools the Northeast schools, but we acknowledge that this doesn't represent the quadrant all schools are located in. We know that we have schools that are located in the Northwest, Northeast and Southeast parts of the city. Uh, the groups and names for all the schools overlap somewhat and we were not intending to exclude or disregard any schools or communities in the naming and we will try to adjust this and provide a more inclusive and representative name for the group uh, going forward. In all these sessions, we're pleased to have members of our Board of Trustees in attendance to hear your perspectives on the high school scenarios. With us tonight, we have Trustees Marilyn Dennis, Mike Bradshaw, and Richard Hare. Welcome to you all. As well, we have members of superintendent's team here with us at these sessions. As decision makers, they all take an active interest in understanding what's on the minds of all participants in this initiative, parents, students, staff, and community members. I'm pleased to introduce the team to you. Chris Usi, Joanne Pittman, Darlene Unruh, Danny Breton, Brad Grundy, Rob Armstrong, Kellyanne Fenny, and Marla Martin Esposito. We have several education directors here with us this evening. Some are part of our high school engagement planning team and some represent the schools we are discussing this evening. I'm happy to introduce Calvin Davies, Michelle Powell, Scott McNeil, Teresa Martin, Chris Needen, Martin Poyer, Lori Pritchard, and Diana Rolson. We also have directors Latosia Campbell-Walters and Keith Johnson, principals Ken Chi, Ryan Emond, Matt Fell, Jennifer Gorkoff, Christos Sagriotos, and Mike Wilson. We also have members of the high school engagement planning team, Connor McGreesh, Deb Hamilton, and a new member of the team, Adele Lowther. You will hear some of these subject matter experts here this evening, and some you may not hear from. That said, all our education directors, high school principals, and high school engagement planning team um, have played an active and important role in this work. Now I'd like to ask Joanne Pittman, Superintendent of School Improvement, to share some opening remarks with you. And Joanne, just give me one moment. Hello everyone. Um, as Karen said, my name is Joanne Pittman. I'm the superintendent of school improvement and just want to thank you all for joining us this evening for our virtual session discussing the high school scenarios. Certainly we know that we make better decisions when we have the opportunity to hear thoughts and perspectives of those who are affected or may be affected. And we know that high school is an important time in any student's journey of learning. So we're pleased to connect with you today we know this is a different structure and we really appreciate your patience as we work through and make sure we're able to gather your perspectives. The purpose of our meeting is to share information with you about two high school scenarios and provide an opportunity for you to ask questions and share comments about the scenarios overall, as well as the four schools we're focusing on this evening. I'd like to emphasize that student learning and student success is at the heart of any decision we make at the CBE. And while we know that these scenarios propose significant changes for some schools and some communities, our approach allocates resources where they will have the most positive impact for students overall. Both scenarios provide quality learning opportunities that allow students to meet the requirements to complete high school. 
And with that said, we know that you will all have preferences for one scenario over another, and this is your chance to express that. You may also have certain components of one scenario you prefer over another. Again, an opportunity for you to share that. We encourage you to share your feedback with us so that we can consider it in decision making. That's what this phase of engagement is all about. And I'd like to now pass it over to Karen and thank you again for attending this evening. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, just to give you a sense of what we plan to cover here this evening, this is what our agenda looks like. We've already covered the introductions and wel welcoming remarks, and next we'll explain how we're approaching questions at this session. Then we'll touch on a few key aspects of this initiative overall before we delve into more of the details about the scenarios. In addition to talking about the scenarios overall, we'll spend some time on each of the six schools in this group. We'll provide time for questions and answers at multiple points in the presentation, and then close our session by talking about next steps. We will open up the question and answer window closer to our first Q&A time, and this will show up on the right hand side of your screen. How this will work is that you can type in your question here. We won't be providing written responses during the meeting as we want to ensure that we don't distract too much from the presentation. However, we have several subject matter experts here this evening to answer your questions verbally. We would just ask that you don't get too far ahead in typing in your questions. For example, if you have a question about a specific school, then please wait until we've presented the information about that school before you type in your question, as there's a good chance the presentation may touch on that. We will pause at several points to take questions. The first opportunity will be to ask questions on scenarios overall. Uh, then we'll pause after speaking about each school to take some questions. And then if there's still time, we'll have time after that to answer any other general questions that may have come up during the session. We will have someone moderating questions that come in and we welcome all comments and feedback, but it's important that comments and questions be shared in a respectful way. We will answer the questions submitted on the idea board in advance of this session first and then move on to others. In the interest of time, we may also have to paraphrase questions raised on the idea boards or in the Q&A window for this session. Please keep in mind that we won't be publishing comments in the Q&A window. We will just publish questions to be answered. If a question has already been answered or will be addressed in the presentation, it also won't be published. That said, we will have all comments and questions documented and recorded as written and all will be reviewed and considered in decision making. Entering it once is enough. Any comments or questions not covered in our session tonight can be provided on the idea boards available on our website. And I just want to stress that these are idea boards uh, different from the ones to submit the questions in advance of sessions. There are eight idea boards organized by program where you can share your uh, thoughts and perspectives on the scenarios. Um, also, please keep in mind that we have a lot to cover in our session including discussing six schools, so it's really important that we balance airtime fairly. There were some questions submitted for this session about maps and designations for communities, as we have a lot of content to cover in talking about the programs and schools, uh, we are not able to answer questions that are specific to individual situations. All the information is available on our website in the story map, scenario overview, and other information posted there. Questions have arisen during this phase of engagement about the process itself. So I wanted to let people know that all community engagement initiatives at the CBE are guided by our framework for community engagement called Dialogue. This framework demonstrates our commitment to engage with parents, students, staff and community members in a way that is accountable, honest, inclusive, responsive, and demonstrates mutual respect. Also in May 2019, when, when we launched this engagement process, we shared a detailed engagement plan or roadmap. 
and it has been updated a few times since then. This document answers all those questions about who will make the decision, what will be considered in decision making, what's in scope and out of scope, and more. It was also developed considering feedback provided by our high school engagement advisory group, which includes student, parent, staff, and trustee representatives. So if you have any questions about these things and haven't reviewed this plan, I encourage you to have a read through it. Um, the most recent version was uh, updated last month. Just to remind everyone what this engagement is all about, we aim to balance enrollment at our schools in a way that maintains access, flexibility, and choice for students and considers available space and resources. We want to emphasize that in doing this, we need to consider what is best for student learning overall. We are still on track to implement any changes for the 2022-23 school year as indicated at the outset of this project. This timeline gives you a snapshot of the overall timing and for the points at which you can share your thoughts and perspectives, which are highlighted in blue. You can see that after this phase, there will be another opportunity for feedback before a decision is made. The proposed plan will be informed by the feedback gathered now on scenarios. It may be a blend of scenarios A and B. However, we will not introduce new elements in the proposed plan that are not represented in either scenario A or B. And in reviewing the feedback, decision makers will not just look at preferences for scenarios overall, but will evaluate the preferences in different program areas and different communities. The exact timing of when the proposed plan is shared for feedback will de depend on work required to develop it um, based on the feedback that we gather on the scenarios. So we expect that to be June or September, but we aren't certain exactly which it'll be at this point and expecting that a final decision will be communicated no later than December. If we can communicate it sooner than December, we will, but it will definitely happen by that date. The scenarios we have developed are based on the feedback gathered from the parents, students, and staff from fall 2019, the CBE values, and our planning principles. We heard from more than 2,000 parents, students, staff, and community members at that time, and all of the feedback that was gathered is available on our website. As you can imagine, there were a wide range of perspectives expressed in the input provided last fall, but there was also common ground. These were the common themes that emerged. First, maintaining current grade configurations. Then, probably one of the strongest themes that came through was about the importance of offering a strong regular program and having consistency and quality across high schools. This was very important to parents. Also, there was recognition about how proximity, travel time, and the logistics of this can have a significant impact for students and families. So all of these themes helped guide us in scenario development, along with consideration of our planning principles, available space and resources, sustainability, and other factors. The scenarios were not arrived at easily. I can tell you that they are the result of intense debate, lively discussion, and thoughtful consideration. And now I'll pass it over to Teresa Martin to talk more about what both scenarios provide and how they differ from one another. And Teresa, just give me one moment to cue you up here. Over to you. Thanks, Karen. Both scenarios provide quality learning opportunities that allow students to meet the requirements to complete high school. They do this in three key ways. First, by providing a more equitable learning experience for all high school students. Secondly, maintaining a regular program at every high school. And the third, allow for alternative programs and academic enrichment when the criteria are met. It was important to have criteria that would guide decisions made about alternative programs and academic enrichment. Equity, 
sustainability, and the learning experience offered by programs were all important considerations. When you look at both scenarios, both scenarios help to address the objective of this engagement by balancing out utilization across our high schools. If no changes were made, we would expect to have only 30% of our high schools in the balanced utilization range. With both scenarios we are presenting to you, we are able to improve that significantly to have 71% of schools in the balanced utilization range. When our schools are closer to the balanced range, students are able to have better learning experiences and as we are able to avoid overcrowding and limitations on scheduling of classes. This is very important in providing the best opportunities possible for our students into the future. Now let's take a look at the scenario comparison. Both scenarios include some consolidation of high school programs. Scenario B provides a greater degree of consolidation than scenario A. Regular program. The scenarios do propose some communities be redesignated re to different high schools than they currently attend. However, four out of five students in the regular program will continue to be designated to the same high school in both scenarios. In scenario B, more students would be closer to home than in scenario A. IB. Both scenarios propose reducing from five locations down to four. Three of the locations are the same in both scenarios, with the fourth location changing. Lester B. Pearson for one scenario and John G. Diefenbaker in the other. French immersion. For French immersion, we are providing two possibilities. In scenario A, we are proposing that we continue to have four locations, but we make a change to location from Lester B. Pearson to Robert Thirst. In scenario B, we are proposing some consolidation to three locations in order to gain efficiencies. The thinking here was to maintain the program at current locations where student enrollment numbers are high for a robust program. Spanish bilingual. We are proposing we consolidate from two locations down to one location in scenario A. Crescent Heights is a more central location for the program when consolidated to one site than either Dr. E.P. Scarlett or William Aberhart. This location also helps balance out enrollment among high schools. In scenario B, we are proposing that the Spanish bilingual program is discontinued at the high school level. Students who have attended a Spanish bilingual program K-9 and wish to receive Spanish language credentialing may do, may do so through the IB language program components offered at Henry Wisewood, John G. Diefenbaker, Sir Winston Churchill and Western Canada, or make an arrangement to complete the appropriate DELA examination through the DELA organization. Art-centered learning. In both scenarios, this program is eliminated at the high school level. Just to be clear, there isn't another programming replacing art-centered learning. High school programming has evolved since the inception of art-centered learning program was since it was introduced. Students in the regular program at high school now have the flexibility and, and significantly increased opportunities to incorporate arts within their regular courses at the high school level. French IB. This specialized program this specialized program may not be sustainable into the future, considering cost and student enrollment. We've provided one scenario where it continues and one where it does not. This is an important graphic organizer. It summarizes program enrollment at the high school level. It provides you a view of the enrollment at the different of the different high school programs in the Cal Calgary Board of Education. 90% of our students are in the regular program at high school. The remaining 10% are distributed across French Immersion with 6%, International Baccalaureate 2%, Spanish Bilingual 1% and Art-Centered Learning 1%. It's important for us all to remember that when, when we make decisions to balance enrollment at CBE high schools, these decisions are made for the full student population across all these programs 
and consider what is best for the overall learning. So when you look at this infographic, it visually helps to put the program enrollment across the Calgary Board of Education into context. One out of 100 students are in art-centered learning. One out of every 100 students are in Spanish bilingual. Two out of every 100 are in IB. Six out of 100 are in French immersion. 90 out of 100 students are attending in the regular program. This is significantly this is important for us to consider as we move forward in our decision making. Regular program. If these changes, if with these changes, students might be moving to an alternative program into, let me say that again. If with these changes, students might be moving from an alternative program into a regular program in the future, it's important to know that all CBE students have a designated school for the regular program that they are able to attend. If students want to attend a school other than the school they are designated to for regular programming, for IB or another sequence of courses unique to a school, they will need to follow the high school transfer process. Details are available on our website. Now, I'd like to pass it on to Martin for the next portion related to Spanish bilingual. Thank you. Thank you. Bonsoir. Uh, buenas noches. There were several questions submitted about the Spanish bilingual program. The information in the next couple of slides address those. It's important to recognize the fact that the trends over time show us that many students who take the Spanish bilingual program from kindergarten to grade nine make different, cho make different choices for high school. And this is resulting in low enrollment in the program compared to other programs such as French immersion. With this low enrollment, it is not sustainable to continue offer, offering the program in two locations. These, these low numbers do create inequities for students in different programs. When we have a low, lower number of students in an alternative program at a school that also offers the regular program, there can be inequities among students in the building. For example, the class size for students in the alternative program may be smaller than for students in the regular program. With a more consolidated approach, we can provide a more equitable learning and class size experience for all students, regardless of their program. Both, scenario provide, uh, both scenarios provide opportunities for students to pursue Spanish language acquisition. In scenario A, the program continue, uh, continues at Crescent High, High School. In scenario B, B as Director Martin uh, mentioned before, there are other ways students can attain Spanish language proficiency through IB language courses or Spanish language and culture courses. However, these opportunities do not meet the requirement of language instruction for a bilingual, a bilingual language program. Students who have attended a Spanish bilingual program and wish to receive Spanish language credentialing may choose to do so through the IB program component and the daily examination, but students would not be eligible for the Spanish, uh, the International Spanish Academy certificate. Thank you. I'll now pass it back to Director Martin. For the phasing out of program. Thanks, Karen. When we say phasing out, we mean that students are able to complete the program at the same location where they started. In the two scenarios, we propose phasing out programs whenever we have the resources to allow for it. This is possible for IB, French IB, and Spanish if there are at least 25 students per grade enrolled. It is also possible for art-centered learning regardless of the number of students. 
phase out may not be possible for French immersion at Lester B. Pearson. So in that situation, students would be redesignated to the new locations starting in September 2022. When it comes to the regular program and community redesignations, students attending a school in 2021-22 will be able to complete high school at that same school. Phasing out will not, sorry, phasing out will not be provided for siblings attending other schools. Now, let me pass it over to Michelle to speak to the next slides regarding IB. Thank you so much, Teresa. My name is Michelle Howell, and part of my portfolio is working with our schools um, that have the IB program. So we wanted to put this slide together uh, to, tonight to talk a little bit about the concerns that we heard about removing the IB program from Lester B. Pearson in scenario B in terms of providing equity and access to students. So we thought it would be helpful to, to share what needs to be considered when choosing an IB location. So to begin, in terms of the access to schools, it's really important to consider not just the quadrant where it's located, but also things like the transportation routes. So something that's really important to think about when parents are moving from grade nine to grade 10 is that there's a, a large number of alternative programs or unique course offerings that will be new to students when they go into high school. So with that also comes larger um, boundaries that are attached to some of those programs. So IB or AP might be also examples of that. So specifically right now, we wanted to share that from the Northeast. So any family living in the Northeast, um, we have families that are attending other IB schools other than Lester B. Pearson as out of attendance. So specifically, we have 16 students who would otherwise be attending Pearson who are currently attending other IB schools. In addition to that, we have 82 students who are living in the Northeast again, who are designated to John G. Diefenbaker. So those students are all using public transportation to access those IB programs at those schools. So a good example of that would be Western Canada, where there's a C train that's beside that school. So that would be a consideration for a family if that was going to be manageable. Um, another point to think about is the number of students who from the IB program um, that attend a school that must be considered in providing that long term sustainability. So what we mean by that is that the IB program asks all of our schools to really offer a large um, variety of choices of programs that are part of IB. So with that, um, we need to think about the components that come with offering all of those choices. You need students for those classes. So again, when grade nines often enter high school, what happens is that they think they want to be full IB program students. That's what I want to do. That's my path. But what we're finding in all of our high schools is that as students progress in their experience in high school from grade 10 to 12, they have some different interests, some different things come their way, and they don't continue that full program. So as a result, there's that attrition that comes into the program and it becomes tougher to be able to offer those classes. So the advantage to offering um, a more congregated number of schools when thinking about IB is that we'll have more students available at each of our schools to offer all of those choices of classes, which will be a real benefit. Um, as well, we wanted to just highlight that there are still going to be the three IB locations that are the same. There is no change other than to some of the changes of communities that will be uh, designated to those schools. And that's specifically Henry Wisewood, Sir Winston Churchill and Western Canada. The other two possibilities that we are discussing this evening um, are to provide that fourth IB location one in the northeast and one in the northwest. So they're about 12 to 14 kilometers apart, depending on the route that you take. So we're really looking forward to hearing your feedback um, as we look into making these decisions. It will be really, really vital to hear from you. Thank you. And I think now we are going to be moving into some specific questions around uh, the scenarios. So I think we're going to pause here and address the questions um, that are going to be starting to be asked. So we're going to ask Deb to let us know what questions we have in the queue to answer now or before we move on. Thank you.
Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so the first question here is for Darlene. And it is, um, sorry, Darlene, you showed up and I couldn't read the question. <laughs> oh, my apologies, Deb. <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, what proof will you provide that feedback influenced decisions? So in all our engagement initiatives, we're transparent in sharing the results of the input and feedback we receive on our public website. In addition, when we communicate a decision, we indicate how your feedback gathered influenced the decision that was made. There are usually very diverse perspectives on what is the best direction to take. All of these perspectives must be considered and balanced to make the decision that's best for our students' learning overall. Thanks, Darlene. And the next question, uh, next couple of questions are for you as well. Um, Second question, I don't agree that scenario A provides equality. Specialized programming is pri prioritized over planning principles. Please explain. So in looking at our planning principles, they cannot all be met at the same time for every community in every instance. And in trying to address specific planning principles, we always need to consider how they are addressed for students overall. For example, uh, when you saw the pictograph earlier, uh, we showed that we have minimized uh, disruption overall for four out of five students that will continue to attend the same school as they did before. However, that planning principle doesn't hold true for one out of five of our students. So when we're talking about equality, um, you'll note the distinct difference between scenario A and scenario B specific to our planning principles. Thanks, Darlene. And the next question. Please tell me more about how changes will impact students with special needs. How are they considered? So in all of our schools, we have uh, populations of complex needs students. In looking at those populations, schools are certainly um, equipped to address the needs of the students within their schools. So regardless of which high school your child is designated to, uh, our principals ensure that there are processes in place uh, for staff to be supported in meeting the needs of your child, for students to feel supported and for families to feel supported. Thanks, Darlene. And one more question for you before we move on. Uh, please explain how you expect changes to Spanish bilingual program to affect the French immersion program. So for parents that are choosing a second language program, um, they, they are choosing it uh, often because they wish for their child to have that experience. Um, whether it's in French immersion or Spanish bilingual. Those are the only two language programs that we do offer at the high school level. We have many other alternative programs that we offer in language that are discontinued at the grade nine level. So what may we see? Although the hours of instruction are quite different between a bilingual program and a French immersion program, uh, for those families that are choosing to have their child educated in a language outside of English, uh, we could potentially see an increase in our French immersion programs depending on which scenario is chosen as a path forward. Thank you, Darlene. And the next question that was submitted uh, through the idea boards is for Martin. 
My high school student left the Spanish program to attend Pearson for IB. If the school no longer offers IB, can she be accepted back into the Spanish program? Uh, the short answer is yes. There's a caveat. If the student has maintained their Spanish level, uh, either by practicing or uh, continuing a different course uh, at Pearson, uh, and the level or level of the student's level of Spanish would be assessed when she applies to enter in the program. Thank you, Marta. And the final question submitted through the idea boards before we get to the Q&A uh, that's been submitted live this evening is for Danny Breton. How did you consider families who cannot afford to drive students to school or pay for transportation? How was the regular program considered? Good evening. Um, so there are, I guess, several ways that um, families uh, were considered in this regard. First and foremost um, is the way that you see the two scenarios and how they are uh, uh, developed, how they were developed. Um, and so specifically scenario B, while consolidating even more alternative language programs and in fact offering even fewer in the sense that uh, Spanish would no longer be offered, um, what that does is that it provides for more space in high schools uh, for students attending the regular program to attend closer to home. So in, what we find then under scenario B is that's where we get the most students as close as possible to uh, their regular, uh, to their designated regular program school. In addition to that, uh, what other considerations have we taken into account? Um, we also have taken, of course, into account the Calgary Fair Entry Program, and that is a, a, a transit program that offers um, families uh, three price bands for those who meet certain criteria uh, in terms of household income. And the price bands start at $5.45 per month, $38.15 per month, or $54.50 per month, depending upon how much um, a citizen, uh, depending on what the, the household income is. Uh, and so then that allows, um, again, folks to be able to access transportation. And lastly, um, the Calgary Board of Education, uh, of course, is, is committed to ensuring that no student is prevented from accessing um, uh, their education because of a lack of money. And so we do also have a waiver program. And so failing uh, the previous um, uh, fair entry program that I just explained. There is also a process uh, for families to apply for a waiver uh, to be able to be provided with uh, Calgary Transit Pass for their student. Thank you, Danny. Um, now we'll go to questions submitted live this evening in our Q&A. Um, the first question was submitted at 6.30. Michelle Howell mentioned student attrition is a considering uh, consideration for reducing the number of IB programs. Have these rates of students leaving IB been tracked at each of the IB schools? Michelle? Uh, we do track those numbers. Um, so what happens is that we do it at two levels. The first level is that we track them um, at the school level because we, all, we are always working with our students to be able to create those ongoing learning plans uh, while they're with us in high school. So that would be through their counselors and then their counselors with admin, because we need to create classes around that as the years follow up. Um, as well, uh, our, our planning team also tracks those numbers because we have our projection numbers, the numbers that we need to plan for for the following year that are given to high schools each year. So that's another level of tracking where that comes in. Yeah, and then I see, sorry, Deb, I see there's another question that just follows that. Um, and it's just a, a saying that around that there's two out of every 100 students in, are in the IB program. Does that include students who are taking partial or is that just full IB? Um, what is the number for any students taking IB courses full or partial? So that number would be for both programs. So either partial or for full, that would include that number. 
So in terms of the numbers specifically uh, for IB full or partial, that would depend a little bit on the school, but I will let you know that as an example, this year um, at Henry Wisewood, although we had um, about 250 grade 10s join us for IB, our grade 12s, we have about 20 students that are still in full IB. So it's quite a large percentage of students that move to partial. Thank you. Hi, um, Michelle, I just wanted to, um, so I created that graphic and the two out of every hundred is actually only uh, full IB program. There was a decision by the uh, high school engagement planning team to okay. recommend full program. Oh, it's a good thing that you're part of that team. I assumed it was both. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, thanks, Deb. Um, the next question um, is uh, students who are being directly impacted by the high school changes, program loss, or community redesignation that are currently in grade eight will not know the certainty of their high school journey until December of their grade nine year. Will there be support for this subset of students as they transition into a new plan that they have limited time to prepare for? Um, that question is, um, Darlene, could you perhaps start that question, a response for that question? I'm happy to start, Deb, and if anybody else would like to add following my comments from the team, please feel free to join in. So with all of our students that are currently in middle or junior high, we understand the importance of transitioning our students well. And so although uh, students will not, uh, might not be aware of their high school journey until December of their grade nine year, um, that really is in terms of a time frame. Uh, when our high schools generally would start planning uh, to have their open houses, uh, to share information regarding any of our specialized programming being offered. Uh, our schools work diligently, meaning our middle junior highs with our high schools in ensuring that our students are known as they transition to their new high school. And so as part of the transition plan, uh, once a decision is made, details regarding what that transition will look like for your children will be shared with parents, will involve students and parents as well. And I'm not certain if anyone feels there's additional information to add. Hi, Darlene. I'd also like to add that while this is such a significant and important transition time for our students, we will also be working closely with our schools and with our school staffs to make sure that accurate information is available about what those opportunities are, should there be changes in locations and should there be some differing um, scenarios that unfold that aren't currently in our um, in our experience. So I. I think that the important thing is that as students are beginning to look at their high school experience, that they are beginning to look at what are those opportunities and how might they um, best meet their individual needs, irregardless of whether what the location is, but what are those passions that the student has and how can they uh, meet and address those and, and pursue those um, not just looking at what the location is, but looking at what are those course offerings or what are those specialized programs that they are really keenly interested in. That's the most important piece, irregardless of location. Thanks, Teresa. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so the next question, what percentage of students are in French IB? The infographic didn't break down the statistic. It seems to be important difference in the two scenarios more so than the change to regular IB. Um, so I'm just going to start that um, just with regards to the infographic. Um, the, uh, the French IB program um, is quite 
uh, small, it would represent less than one student, um, less than 1%. And the stats that we looked at were September 2019, and there were 66 students um, enrolled, and uh, there were only 28 students enrolled in the full diploma program at that time. Um, so as you can imagine, that would be hard to represent in a graph of 100 students. Um, Connor, I'm not sure if you have any um, additional information other than the 2019 information that I just provided. Hi, Deb, thanks. I don't have uh, much additional uh, other than to say that there's a lot more students taking partial uh, French IB than full French IB, but I did uh, come come live on the video. Just I see the next question. I thought I would just jump into it because the, the next two or that question and this next one are numbers related. So the question was, do you know the total percentage of students who complete Spanish immersion through to grade 12? How many drop off in grade 7, grade 10, etc? So um, there is what we call attrition year to year in many of our language programs. With French and Spanish, we see attrition in every grade. And in Spanish, it's about 6% on average each year. So that means that every year there's a few students you know, that leave every class, maybe one, maybe two students that leave each class. But overall, as a system, we see about 6% of the students leave the program. But in grades 10 and in, in grades, the transition times out of the elementary school. So grade seven isn't uh, the best measure in the sense that we have Spanish bilingual schools that finish at different times. So looking at the grade 10 in particular, um, it's about one in four students, 73% or so continue on with 25 or 27% uh, making other choices into grade 10. And we see um, slightly higher attrition rates in, in those transition years I mentioned earlier in grades uh, six and seven. We see about 90% uh, continue on, so about 10% attrition, which is a little bit higher than the average year over year. Thanks, Connor. <clears throat> and um, the next question, um, is, uh, I believe, um, Michelle Howell, if I can direct this to you. Um, have you considered the optics of only offering high school French immersion and IB in West Calgary, given that East Calgary is often marginalized? Could this further the perceived imbalance of have schools versus have not schools in the system? Um, hi, yeah, I think the, the one comment that I would say there, and then I would also um, just see if Connor had anything to add there in terms of some information, is that in looking at those optics, like I mentioned earlier, we actually have a significant number of students, 82 students are living currently in the Northeast and attend uh, a West school, as we mentioned, uh, with John G. Diefenbaker. And then I did mention the other students as well. So we are currently having students already attend some of those schools. Um, so I think that that's just one component that I would add. And then I would just see if anybody, any of my colleagues would want to add on to that. Maybe if I could add. So again, this is uh, Danny Breton. Um, so thank you. The, uh, the, the, the really the challenge here that uh, we are trying to lay out within those scenarios, uh, it goes back to um, the uh, the issue of trying to get students as close as possible to their regular program school, and just how dense. Um, the large numbers of high school students that are currently and projected to be within the Northeast. And so trying to, to, to walk that, uh, that, that very tight line uh, in terms of uh, 
trying to provide opportunities for students by making sure that they can access those uh, special programs via uh, um, in, in, by ensuring that uh, they are located along uh, Calgary Transit uh, max lines or along uh, present or future C train lines, um, while at the same time trying to maximize the space within Northeast schools to minimize the distance that the majority of students, the majority of course being those attending regular programs, have to travel to get to their schools. And so very, you know, very good point here that uh, it, you know, optically could uh, uh, certainly be looking like that. Uh, of note, of course, Western Canada uh, has the French um, offering um, that would continue under the, the two scenarios. And notwithstanding, uh, you know, whether the address on there says Southwest, Southeast, Northeast or Northwest, it is very central. We all know that that's essentially downtown. And so it's easily accessible uh, for students to uh, get to Western Canada um, via the uh, Calgary Transit. Thanks, Danny. <clears throat> and just looking down uh, through the questions um, and in the interest of balancing airtime fairly, I'm going to move on to a question regarding art-centered learning. Um, this was submitted at 6.43 by Pam. And the question is, ACL has a high number of kids that have special needs that their local school were unable to support. How will you ensure these kids are supported? Hi, I wanted to say that if, if students have uh, unique learning needs or special needs, they're supported through transition plans if they're coming from a feeder school for, as a junior high. If they're coming between high schools for, for other purposes uh, besides the ACL program, they would be, their needs would be met with just teachers and uh, resources, learning resources, people at the school, identifying what the special needs are and what the unique learning needs are, and then they would appropriately uh, make a unique learning plan for those students. And so we do know with ACL leaving uh, the schools, that with interdisciplinary learning and teachers teaching in different ways now can, can also bring in the arts into core programming. So all students can be accommodated going forward. And I think the key part is the transition plan or you know, making sure the high school and the, and the middle school, junior high know that uh, to communicate the needs to the high school. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. <clears throat> And um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, how will academic enrichment be fostered in Northeast communities if the French Immersion and IB program will be made more centralized? Will AP be sufficient in replacing these programs? Michelle? Sorry, Deb, can you tell me what time that question was? Yes, it was at 6.40. Oh, okay, I'm going to go back. Okay. All right, so how will academic enrichment be fostered? Um, will AP be sufficient in replacing these programs? So AP, just to talk a little bit about that, um, is it also another academic enrichment program? And the really nice aspect about AP that's a little bit different than IB is that it is actually offered in every single one of our high schools that don't offer IB except for one. So it's really accessible by all high schools and they've already created the resource plans to be able to um, support those programs. The next piece is that with AP, they can be very specific to one course only. So they actually offer a little bit more flexibility. So when we're looking about academic enrichment, AP or advanced placement is a very much an academic enrichment program that would certainly um, be an opportunity to be able to support those programs that we are talking about. Thanks, Michelle. <clears throat> and I'm now going to pass it uh, to Connor, I believe, um, for uh, some more details. And just a note, I do. Um, there's a question here from a Forest Lawn High School parent. And when we get to Forest Lawn High School, 
um, I will make uh, note of the time of your question and we'll um, we'll respond to it at that time. Hi, so I'm going to talk to you over the next number of slides and first we're going to start by covering utilization and what is util utilization and why it is important and why are we talking about it. So utilization is the way the province of Alberta measures how full a school is. Capacity and utilization rates contribute to planning decisions such as modular classroom allocations and capital project approvals. It's also used when calculating operations and maintenance grants for school authorities for the operation, maintenance and security of all school buildings. So utilization is a calculation of the weighted enrollment divided by the school's provincial capacity. In the broadest sense, the calculation takes the square meters of the school and converts it into capacity. So regular classroom, CTS spaces, etc. are taken into account in this calculation. The provincial capacity is provided to us from the province and it excludes any exemptions we might have for leases in our buildings. This is updated yearly and would reflect changes at the school over the previous school year. Weight enrollment is used to give a higher weighting, so space used by students with complex learning needs. These students are counted as using three times the space in a building. This is why a school might have utilization of 100% or higher, yet their projection graph shows those stacked columns not quite reaching that capacity line. Future, utiliz rate, future utilization rates are estimated based on the past, past proportion of uh, complex learners in the school. This is even more pronounced in some of our schools that tend to have a high number or high proportion of complex learners than others. So this difference between schools is generally tied back to system classes uh, that would have a high proportion of these students as well. Some schools may have 10% of their population as complex learners, whereas others schools might only have 2% of their population that would fit that category. So a little bit about our enrollment projections and our, our maps. So planning projections use the items listed on the slide to inform our individual school projections. To give an example, when we but when a new and developing community is designated to a school, there may be a time when that community may come to outgrow the space in the designated school. So planning uses these factors on the slide to help us determine when this might be. On the flip side, it also helps us track when a school is facing declining enrollment and can be used to determine when and how large of a community we might be able to redesignate to such a school to bolster the enrollment or relieve another school that is at capacity either through a redesignation or an overflow. We use the what's called the cohort survival uh, method to age a population within a school and determine how many students will be there in future years. So in the most simple terms, we look at how many students were in grade uh, 10 in 2020 to calculate how many students will be in grade 11 for 2021. We then take into account the above mentioned factors to help us determine how a population might grow or shrink uh, year over year. So I'm going to move on now. We're going to talk about individual schools. Um, so looking here at, we have Crescent Heights in scenario A. With the opening of the new North High School, Crescent Heights will have a very large portion of their current and future school population redesignated. This means Crescent Heights High School will be able to accommodate students from other programs or areas of areas of the city to help balance enrollment system wide. Scenario A would see the Spanish bilingual program redesignated from William Aberhart to Crescent Heights, as well as accommodate students from uh, Chinatown and Eau Claire to help balance enrollment at Western Canada High School. Crescent Heights scenario B uses the same uses that same space but differently. And instead of a new alternative program, Crescent Heights would see a number of new communities added from the Northeast. So these communities that are currently designated to Forest Lawn. This scenario offers a different designation for these communities um, and aligns with our approach to other schools and communities between scenarios, offering schools choice or offering communities choice rather. The movement of Rosemont and Capitol Hill is an opportunity to align designations for these communities. Uh, for example, Capitol Hill is, is currently split 
west and east of 14th Street going to a different school, so this would be an opportunity to align that. So I'm going uh, to pass it back over to Deb, who's going to lead us through the uh, pre-submitted questions from the idea board. Great, thanks, Connor. <clears throat> All right, um, so uh, we have a few questions that were submitted through the idea boards. Um, the first question is for Danny. Will the Spanish bilingual program at the school in scenario A, so at Crescent Heights, um, there may be more students parking at the school. With minimal parking at the school, what is the plan? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, so what is the plan? Transportation for high school students uh, within the Calgary Board of Education um, is, is public transportation. That is the encouraged method of transportation to access all CBE high schools. That's particularly important for uh, high schools that are more inner city. Uh, I think you'll find that uh, parking is typically relatively challenging um, throughout uh, our, our high schools, uh, but certainly within the inner city. So public transportation is the, uh, the, the way to go. Uh, we've ensured that by selecting Crescent Heights, that we're selecting a site that is um, well served by the Max Orange Line. And it's also within walking distance of the future green line of the C train. So that is the plan for transportation. Thank you, Danny. And the next couple of questions are for Connor. <clears throat> the first question, uh, will Crescent Heights High School have space for all Spanish bilingual students in Calgary? Uh, Short answer, yes. So Crescent Heights is able to accommodate the, the students projected to be enrolled in the Spanish bilingual program into the future. So if you remember on my earlier slides, when I mentioned the, the North High opening, this is gonna uh, make available a lot of space at Crescent Heights School. So they will have capacity into the future for this program. The, the next uh, question- Actually, on... Connor, one moment. Um, there is a question in the Q&A that does kind of go into a bit more detail about the space. I'm just wondering if the attrition is not as high as we're predicting, can Crescent Heights still accommodate the Spanish bilingual program? So that kind of ties in to the, the next question on the slide a little bit. So the uh, being is that does it take into account consolidation to a single site? So the projection assumes, actually assumes a change in enrollment patterns with consolidation to a single site. So um, some parents have gone in and um, given feedback on the idea boards that, well, when you add the two Dr. E.P. Scarlett projection and the William Aberhart projection, you take those Spanish numbers and add them together, it doesn't equate to the same number. It's not the same at Crescent Heights. That's because we do project a change and predict a change in enrollment patterns. Um, once we consolidate to a single site, um, we project many uh, a drop. We project enrollment to drop from the south communities after the consolidation, especially. Um, but as well, I would say that in terms of back to the space at Crescent Heights, you know, Crescent Heights currently they have a large number of out of attendance area students at the school. So Crescent Heights has the ability to manage that in addition to the number to manage that in a concert with the Spanish as it comes up from grade nine. So if there's an increase in expected Spanish students into the future, the school should be able to manage that. Great, thanks Connor. And the next two questions are for Darlene. <clears throat> the first question is, what is the impact on Crescent Heights staff if Spanish bilingual program is offered at the school? And so um, with the deployment of staff and co course deployment, um, it is at the responsibility of the principal and can be influenced by student timetabling and staff teachables. So in this instance, teachers assigned to teach courses in Spanish um, aside from Spanish language arts, uh, options perhaps 
will need to have the necessary qualifications to do so in the language of instruction, which is Spanish. So often teachers will also have experience or qualifications in areas other than Spanish. And these are taken into consideration as well when allocating teacher assignments. Thanks, Darlene. And the next question is Crescent Heights already supports Spanish, German and Chinese. If scenario B is chosen, will more out of attendance area students be accommodated to access the Spanish language classes? And so I believe we need to clarify that languages at the 10, 20 and 30 level, which is what is being offered currently at Crescent Heights, are different than participating in a Spanish bilingual program. So if students are choosing to register for a language specific course, that would be addressed through our school transfer process. If the language specific courses they were seeking are not offered at their designated school. Thanks, Darlene. <clears throat> and now moving to the, um, the live Q&A. Um, there was a question submitted at 659, um, and this one will be for Connor. Will students entering high school in 2022 from the community of Rosemont, which is one of Calgary's smallest communities, be given the opportunity to choose between Crescent Heights or James Fowler, regardless of which scenario is chosen? Hi, thanks for the question. So around transition in 2022 coming out of grade nine. So projections have been prepared with all students moving forward from grade nine to into uh, James Fowler School in that particular scenario. So at this point, I would say we're expecting those students to uh, attend their designated high school into grade 10. Thanks, Connor. Uh, and another question um, on the last slide shown for Crescent Heights School. It was stated that Forest Lawn is too full and therefore students need to be redesignated. My child is being redesignated to Forest Lawn, a school which is further from our community in favor of the closer school, which will be under capacity. Did I misunderstand? Connor? Uh, just waiting for my video, thanks. Um, I'd, I'd just like to put a pin in this question for now. We are gonna come to the Forest Lawn slides next, at, at which point I'll dig into that question a little bit deeper. So we'll just hold on to that uh, for now, thanks. Okay, sounds good. All right, and um, just pause for a moment in case there's another Crescent question coming up. And seeing none, uh, we can move on to the next school. So getting right into Forest Lawn in scenario A, um, Forest Lawn currently has three large new and, develop new and developing communities designated to the school, Redstone, Skyview Ranch and Cityscape. These three communities uh, are the furthest from the school and are proposed to be redesignated re in some combination in each of scenario A and B. So Redstone and Skyview Ranch would be redesignated to James Fowler in scenario A. Belvedere, Inglewood and Ramsey are communities adjacent to the existing attendance area and they would be redesignated into Forest Lawn. So I'll address the rationale in more detail in the upcoming slides, but kind of tie back to the question um, previously received. Um, it's important to note that we're moving out more students of Forest Lawn than are moving in. So it's kind of net negative on the school in terms of overall enrollment. So um, Redstone and Skyview are much larger communities and have a lot more students coming out of them than Belvedere, Inglewood and Ramsey do. So that's how we you see students moving in into a school like Forest Lawn is because we have more moving out. 
Um, on to the scenario B, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Um, so in scenario B, Belvedere will be designated uh, to Forest Lawn in scenario B. It's the only new community. And then in, as well in scenario B, Redstone and Skyview Ranch are being redesignated to a different school in this scenario, Crescent Heights instead of James Fowler. And this scenario also sees cityscape redirected, which was not part of the scenario A possibilities. So uh, a little bit on Inglewood and Ramsey to Forest Lawn, high school and school utilization. So there were a lot of uh, questions and comments on the idea board uh, around the topic of um, Inglewood and Ramsey attending Forest Lawn School, Forest Lawn being over capacity, proje projected to be over capacity into the future. So because the federal government canceled the program that was in the school, the CBE can now move to request the use of that space once again. So that's the area above the area office. It's a whole upstairs to a wing of the school. Um, this will give the CBE, so the projections for Forest Lawn High School do increase over time, but this increases over a number of years. And this will give the CBE time to incorporate the previously unavailable space into the capacity of the high school. Along with the fact that Forest Lawn High School just finished a major renovation and with these additional classrooms will mean that the school has space into the future for the students designated there. And there's been a couple um, other main um, ideas on the idea board that I'm going to talk about now for a little bit and then we'll put it up to the questions. So one may, main topic of conversational idea board was what's the rationale? Why are we, what's the decision making process? Why are we designating Inglewood and Ramsey to Forest Lawn High School? So there were lots of comments challenging the scenario that sees Inglewood and Ramsey redesignated to Forest Lawn High School. I'll address these here to try and bring some understanding to our reasoning behind these scenarios as a whole. I want to re remind everyone what is being decided and the desired outcome of our whole engagement is that CBE will communicate a sustainable system-wide plan for high schools and continues to offer student access, flexibility, and choice in programming given available space and resources. If no changes are made, Western Canada School will be well above capacity. Western Canada High School is facing pressure through growth in the regular program, French immersion program, and the continued interest in the IB program. When investigating future space at Western Canada High School, it has to be looked at from a perspective that includes changes across the system. So in both scenarios, students in the French Immersion Program are facing the prospect that it will not be continuing unless we pierce into the future. These, student, these students will, will need a new school to call home. There are students interested in IB, they're going to have to contend with fewer available spots into the future in both scenarios. Or in the case of French IB, it would be unavailable into the, into the future in scenario B. So there are two different scenarios that address this current and future concern at Western Canada High School. Scenario A manages this balance and choice in programming through redesignation of a number of communities. A redesignation of regular program students out of Western Canada High School will split some course after grade nine. As was pointed out on the idea boards, this is counter to one of the CBE's planning principles. CBE planning principles do play a role do play a factor when considering decisions involving student accommodation. The CV planning principles, however, are not a checklist whereby a decision can achieve all these things. For example, in a decision that may keep cohorts of students together, it may limit the student's ability to attend schools close to home as possible. In other, in other decisions we have made, the effective use, use of space and resources has required a greater disruption for some students. Through all decisions, we refer back to these principles and aim to address as many and many as possible given the complexity of the decision at hand. For scenario B, most of these same communities at Western Canada High School are facing the prospect of redesignation, as well as the CBE considering the closure of the French IB program at the same time, reducing access and choice. These scenarios offer two different options on how to balance enrollment between multiple programs, schools and communities. Now, despite that, um, Long-winded answer. I still there's still more to cover on the idea board, so I'm just going to take a sip of water. So the other main uh, topic we heard around this uh, 
Ramsey and Englewood redesignation to Forest Lawn was concerns over transportation. So what consideration was given to transportation in redesignating Englewood and Ramsey to Forest Lawn High School? So there's also been a number of these comments from the idea board discussing the proximity to Western Canada High School versus, for, or versus Forest Lawn High School, which focuses on concerns over ease of access to Western Canada compared to Forest Lawn. Uh, these comments touched on topics of busing access and biking access in particular. Um, when we approach the changes in the regular program for Western Canada High School, we try to ensure that those communities being redesignated continue to access the school in close proximity. Forest Lawn High School meets this criteria. It is not far and it is easy to access. Most of Inglewood has better access to Forest Lawn High School. Ramsey currently is able to access the number 17 bus and it is quite direct to Western Canada High School. So while the connection to the new designation won't be as direct, it, it will be on a route that runs every 15 minutes as opposed to every hour. Now I'm going to turn it over back to Deb to answer the published q and um, Thanks, Connor. And I think it's also important to point out that um, we are sharing two scenarios. In scenario A, um, Inglewood and Ramsey are uh, proposed to be redesignated to Forest Lawn. And in scenario B, they remain at Western Canada. And uh, we are um, we are conducting this active engagement at this time um, to gather feedback from um, affected families as to uh, the the effects of the scenarios. Um, so this is the opportunity to um, share your feedback and and we have been receiving and reading all of it. Um, and Connor, I think you have. Um, uh, so there is a question here. Um, my children go to Forest Lawn. Scenario B is better for this school. How can I vote for Scenario B? Um, I'm going to pass this to Karen as an engagement question. Thanks, Deb. Um, so uh, as, as Deb mentioned, this is this phase of engagement is all about gathering your feedback and your perspectives on the scenarios. So if you have, um, if you want to provide feedback to indicate your thoughts on a particular scenario versus another, you have the online survey as one uh, critical way. So I would say that's really important for everybody to complete is the online survey. So please make sure you do that. We ask questions in terms of how uh, scenarios impact you and your family. And so we are interested in hearing uh, your thoughts and perspectives on that. We also have the idea boards. So I want to emphasize that these are different from the idea boards that were used for the virtual sessions, which were really used to submit questions. Um, the other idea boards that are open until the until March 17th um, provide an opportunity for you to share those comments that you have. So any ideas and thoughts that you have, um, the survey doesn't provide for open ended comments. The idea is that you will share those on the idea boards. So those are really two key ways other than the virtual sessions that you have to share your voice and to share your perspectives on the scenarios. So I encourage all of you um, to share your thoughts in that way to make sure that your voice is heard and, and all of that will be reviewed and considered in decision making. And um, as mentioned before, I think we'll look at it in different uh, program areas, different communities, uh, and a variety of ways that we'll consider uh, what feedback was provided. So um, there's lots of opportunities for you um, to share your thoughts and I encourage you to do that. Thanks, Karen. And I would just want to add that um, when it comes to um, decision making and community engagement, that it's it doesn't come down to a vote because there's lots of complexity and there's lots of factors um, that need to be considered. So um, certainly fill out the survey to um, express your um, thoughts and perspectives around both scenarios, um, but it's not quite as simple as a vote. 
And um, so I did, uh, I'm going back up to 650, which is where that the Forest Lawn um, parent had um, posted earlier this evening. Um, and I think that um, Connor has addressed, uh, largely addressed this uh, question, but I'll read it out. As a parent at Forest Lawn High School, why are we accepting more kids into our overcapacity school in order to make room for special programs at Western? Um, so Connor has um, addressed the, the capacity issue. Um, I'm wondering if um, we can we can address the question about the um, making room for special programs, that, that bit of tension there. Um, so uh, Connor, I think you had addressed this in a previous session around um, some of the levers we're using um, to keep Western uh, below that uh, capacity line. Yeah, okay, thank you, Deb. So I we kind of addressed, and uh, Teresa did a good job of explaining in the beginning the difference between scenarios. So scenario A and scenario B differ in that scenario B sees more consolidation of um, other course alternative programs, art centered learning, IB, whereas scenario A strives to maintain those where possible. So one of those uh, is by uh, moving and balancing communities and programs between Western Canada, Forest Lawn, Crescent Heights, or James Fowler. As I mentioned previously, you know we are moving more students out of Fowler than, sorry, Forest Lawn than we're moving in. So that's that rebalancing that has to take place for this to happen. So we move students from Forest Lawn out. We move some students from Western Canada in which uh, makes that room to continue offering the courses that Western Canada can currently offers. Thanks, Connor. And I'll just pause for a moment to see if there are any further uh, questions related to Forest Lawn. All right, uh, we can move on to the next school. All right, back to me again. So Jack James, we won't be talking too much about Jack James here because the scenarios do not include any changes to Jack James High School. So currently Jack James is accessed by students across the city of Calgary for their knowledge and employability program. So this remains the same in both scenarios. Uh, James Fowler, so this scenario, scenario A, would see a number of new communities redesignated from the Northeast to James Fowler. So Castle Ridge, Coral Springs and Falcon Ridge have a previous relationship with James Fowler as they were designated there prior to the opening of Nelson Mandela. So we reintroduced the idea of that relationship again in scenario A. Skyview Ranch and Redstone uh, designate, are designated to James Fowler High School and it provides an alternative proposal than Crescent Heights in scenario B that we saw earlier. Once the new North High School opens, there will be room at John G. Diefenbaker for the communities of Concordia and St. Chill. This accommodates these communities closer to home, but also makes room um, for the Northeast communities previously mentioned as James Fowler. In both scenarios, the Art Center Learning Program is discontinued. Scenario B. This scenario overall sees a, a lower enrollment long term at James Fowler. The community of Cornerstone is designated to James Fowler in this scenario instead of the other Northeast communities. The Cornerstone community is a newer community compared to the others, and it will take a number of years before enrollment begins to increase. In this, in this scenario, Evanston would be designated to John G. Diefenbaker as opposed to uh, Sage Hill and Concora. So Jack James and James Fowler, I'll pass it back to you, Deb, for the questions. Thanks, Connor. 
Uh, so the first question will be for Danny. <clears throat> will there be transportation for students that live in Castle Ridge and Falcon Ridge to go to James Fowler High School? Thank you, Deb, and uh, thank you for that question. Um, so once more, um, transportation for high school students within the Calgary Board of Education. Um, the preferred uh, method of transportation is public transportation. Uh, based on um, our, our work with Calgary Transit, and, and we do meet with them on a monthly basis, uh, providing them information in terms of where students live and what schools they're attending so that they can uh, monitor their routes and adjust and where possible create express routes. Uh, and so certainly we would be looking to be working with them should this scenario be the one that's selected uh, to see about the possibility of, of creating express routes uh, for that specific um, journey. Um, currently, as it stands, the uh, travel time is within the CBE guidelines, but I do recognize that the number of transfers is a little higher than um, what our guidelines say. And so as a result, again, we would be continuing to work with Calgary Transit to, um, should this scenario be the one that ends up getting uh, selected, uh, looked at getting an express route in place. Of course, we do not control what Calgary Transit does. They are a separate entity. Um, so all we can do is, is provide as much um, information and, and look to try to influence them as much as we can. Thanks, Danny. <clears throat> so the next question is, uh, what is happening to James Fowler? No longer ACL, just back to a regular program. Um, now, ACL is one of two programs at the school. There is a, a regular program at the school. Um, Keith, I'm not sure if you want to speak to the ACL piece. Uh, yes. I'm not, I'm not fully understanding the question, but I think uh, on the ACL side, so we are going back to a regular program and ACL will still be uh, infused throughout the different courses. So we, the, the school will still have a full slate of ACL trained teachers who would be able to still continue teaching through the arts uh, into, into the core programs. And so it will be more of a philosophy that most schools can still, still work with kids uh, by interdisciplinary learning and having the core programs and having the arts infused in the programming like in, like in any other high school. And so the school will be a regular high school um, with a regular program in it and still have different ways to teach students. I'm not sure if I answered the question properly. Thanks, Keith. And I'm not seeing any more questions for James Fowler. Uh, so we can move on to the next school. Uh, Lester B. Pearson. Um, so in Lester B. Pearson, we see some movement um, with Cornerstone uh, going to John G.D. from Baker in this scenario. I would mention that there is no scenario where Cornerstone is able to remain on Lester B. Pearson. This community will have too many students in the future to remain designated. Um, as well, in scenario A for Lester B. Pearson, we see the French and Commercial Program being discontinued with those students uh, being designated to Western Canada High School. These two changes mean that there will be space in the future to maintain most communities currently designated as well as the space for IB into the future. For scenario B, we there are more changes in this scenario for Lester B. Pearson than scenario A. There is more consolidation of programming with the IB and French both discontinued in this scenario. However, this change would mean that there is space for the nearby communities of Castle Ridge, Coral Springs, and Falcon Ridge into the future. Cornerstone, as we saw previously, is redesignated, but this time to James Fowler High School. All of IB is designated to Western Canada High School in this scenario, while French Immersion Program would be directed both to William Averhart and Western Canada High School.
so French immersion at Lester Peter Pearson. So the, um, you know, we've, it was discussed a little bit at the beginning of this meeting, but the student cohort is small and not sustainable in, into the future. So this is why we're seeing it um, discontinued. And the two options for designation, either Western Canada and A or a split. So depending on where you are geographically, it, you might be south of 16th Avenue, so or north of 16th Avenue, and you'd be going to blame Maybach. So through this, through all this, through this whole process, we are looking for, you know, we're looking for your feedback on what you prefer, designation-wise for a French immersion program. Do you feel more aligned with Western Canada, um, or is William Maberhart um, your choice there? So we'd like to hear, hear back about that. And I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna move on to the question portion now. And back to you, Deb. Great, thanks, Connor. Um, so I see a couple of questions recently uh, have recently come in, but I'm actually going to go back up to uh, 638. So fairly early on in our meeting, um, Michelle, this question will be for you. Again, 638. Will the IB career program be moved to Diefenbaker or Western? Um, so what I would say about that is for IB programs, they, they aren't moved. IB programs, what you do is you're actually working with the organization um, to create IB programs at your school. So if, for example, Diefenbaker or Western were interested in looking at an IB uh, career program moving forward, that would have to be um, a qualification that they would work with IB, the organization, to determine if that was something that was suitable for them. And of course, that would be based on a number of factors of our own students, of whether that, that, would, that would be of interest for them, but that would actually be through the IB organization. Thanks, Michelle. And now I'll go back down to, uh, to the more recently submitted questions. <clears throat> the first question um, is, is it possible that because of parent feedback, parent and student feedback, IB programs would be maintained at Pearson, Churchill, and Diefenbaker as all three programs are valuable and show equally good participation by each school population. Um, Darlene, as a decision maker, could I call on you for this question? Deb, can you just give me a timestamp on that question? Yes, it's at 7.29. Perfect, thank you. And so when looking at making the decision um, regarding one scenario over another, um, we know that our schools do have, uh, when we talk about equally, good participation, um, looking at full IB and partial IB and the impacts that that has on each principal as they're starting to plan for, so to schedule and look at their class sizes in respect to regular program class sizes. So of course, we are looking at parent and student feedback and what you provide to us as part of this engagement to help us determine what the best step forward would be in terms of this engagement. You did also hear earlier uh, as part of Karen's overview that we will not be introducing a new option that has not already been shared and vetted through the community and through this engagement process. Thank you, Darlene. And the next question, <clears throat> um, Danny, I, this one is for you. Uh, when the French Immersion Program was designated at Pearson starting in 2003, it was acknowledged at the time that it required more than one feeder junior high. Um, that has only one feeder elementary school. The plan at the time was to open one more uh, French Immersion Junior High program and between two and three French Immersion Elementary schools in Northeast Calgary. Can you explain why this never happened? 
Thank you for that question. Um, that's that question speaks to um, the tremendous growth that has happened in the Northeast. And under the Education Act, alternative programs such as French Immersion um, are um, essentially the Education Acts, the Act provides the opportunity, the option for school jurisdictions to provide alternative programs where resources permit. And in this case, because the Northeast has been growing so rapidly, uh, we don't have the space. We simply don't have the space in our elementary schools or within our middle junior schools. And uh, in fact, we're going through this engagement here because we know there's, there, there's that demographic bubble of students currently going through the middle school years uh, and that will be hitting our, our high schools and are actually starting to hit our, our high schools right now. And that's why we're already experiencing um, pressure uh, at the high school level. So what happened to that plan? Um, unfortunately, the space, the resources did not materialize because the schools, first and foremost, are being used to deliver the regular program and uh, there simply is no space for any other offerings at this time. Thanks, Danny. And the next question is a transportation question. Um, so Danny, um, don't go far. Uh, Cornerstone moves to John G. Diefenbaker under scenario A. It takes over 90 minutes one way via Calgary Transit currently to make that trip. Will yellow bus service be provided for these students to cut the travel time down to 45 minutes one way? So the uh, short answer would be yes, that is definitely something that we would be considering. Uh, recognize that in fact in both scenario A and scenario B, the designation for Cornerstone uh, for transportation wise at this time using Calgary Transit, again our preferred uh, means for students attending high school, uh, both options, both scenarios exceed uh, the minimum or the maximum time guideline as well as the uh, number of transfers. So our, our first course of action, once we know which scenario we're going down towards, will be to work with Calgary Transit to see if they can provide some sort of express route option that would allow uh, students to, to be uh, transported within the guidelines. Failing that, then we would certainly be looking at the possibility of yellow busing uh, for high school students in that instance. Thank you, Danny. And um, the next question was submitted at 7.30. Um, how many students take IB career at Pearson currently? Um, Connor, do you have that data? Michelle might be able to, to fill in the blanks a little bit, but I believe they are roughly about 30 full IB with, you know, maybe 40 or 50 partial in the program. Uh, there's, there's presently 35 students in the career program at, in IB Pearson. Thanks, Keith. <clears throat> um, the next question, um, it seems that scenario B is a better option for all students closer to home, better utilization, but it means Pearson loses IB. Is there a way to do scenario B and keep IB at Pearson? Um, Connor, can I get you to start just with regards to perhaps the potential of blending things? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the challenge of Pearson, and we say rebalance, and this is truly a, a balancing act with the space at Lester B. Pearson. So we have IB and French Immersion, which currently make up around 250 uh, spaces with the partial and the, the French Immersion students. So in scenario B, we are only able to accommodate um, the Coral Springs, those uh, students into the program or into the school because we don't have IB and we don't have French. That's the only way that those can fit. So that's up back to that balancing act I just mentioned. It's 
it's kind of either a one or the other in that in scenario we have. Thanks, Connor. And just one more question here for Pearson. Um, for Northeast students designated to Pearson that have to enroll in other locations to attend IB, will they be guaranteed enrollment? Michelle? Yeah, so what happens currently with IB is that there is an IB uh, designation boundary. And so those boundaries would still be in place if that was the case where um, Pearson students would be um, going to other IB programs. So in terms of uh, guaranteed enrollment, just to clarify, IB is a registration. So there's not, um, there's not uh, an issue in terms of questioning whether students are able to enroll. However, uh, there is a process that students are asked to follow in terms of submitting an expression of interest and some other documents for us to be able to get to know the students, to be able to understand where they're going to be most successful. So for any of that information, uh, we would recommend that students, uh, or sorry, students and parents take advantage of our IB website because all of that information is on there. Great, thanks, Michelle. And uh, now we will go on to our next school. Nelson Mandela, scenario A. So Nelson Mandela is one of our most full high schools. And the interim designation that was put in place was needed, was a needed step which addressed the immediate and pressing space issues in Nelson Mandela High School. So scenario A maintains the interim designation in its entirety. Scenario B for Nelson Mandela is an adjustment on that. So those communities redesignated, it's the same communities as scenario A, but they, were, they would then attend a different school than they would in scenario A. So Castle Ridge, Coral Springs, and Fall Courage would attend Lester B. Pearson in scenario B. And I'm back to you, Deb. Thanks, Connor. And Adele, are there any questions for Nelson Mandela at this time? No, there aren't any at this time. All right. So Seeing none, um, we can uh, move on to uh, other questions or comments. <clears throat> so I'm going to go back up to the top because I know that I skipped over some in order to uh, to move through various programs um, in the uh, overall. Uh, so I am going to a question that was posted at 634. Um, the speaker said that the plan will include information from scenario A and B, but nothing from outside those scenarios. How will idea board ideas be considered if there is no flexibility for inclusion of new ideas or ideas pertaining to existing situations? In the cases where programs are possibly cancelled, there seems to be no middle ground. The programs are either still offered or not. What kind of ideas do you expect on those boards that you would actually consider for inclusion in the plan? Karen? So I will start and then I might invite uh, others to add to it um, who, who may be involved in the decision making um, group. But so at this at this stage in terms of um, not introducing new ideas, it's important to, at this stage that people can provide feedback, feedback on what's presented and that uh, this be an iterative process that one uh, phase builds on the next. So um, making sure that um, people are not caught off guard with new ideas being brought forward in the next phase is really important uh, in terms of the process. There are still lots of opportunities to comment on what is 
um, captured within scenario A and scenario B, and because there will be blending, there will be opportunities to look at um, incorporating aspects from A and aspects from B, but you're correct in sort of flagging that uh, we wouldn't be looking at introducing brand new concepts at this stage, um, and that it's important that the, the feedback be focused on what is um, presented within those two scenarios. But it may be that uh, Darlene or someone else could add to that in terms of their perspective um, in the process of all of this. Thanks, Karen. Um, so I think an important piece that we we need to remember is as we were developing the two scenarios that we uh, we are proposing this evening, these are scenarios that address the problem of not only overutilization and underutilization within our schools, but it also allows us to be able to offer programming within our within our budget and the realities of being able to balance our resources within the budgets that we are provided. And so when we're looking for your feedback and and your ideas, um, when you're looking at either one of the scenarios, if you can uh, suggest or if you're thinking about ways that uh, we can continue to offer uh, an alternative program um, with a specific class size that won't be impacting our regular class sizes, we, we're certainly open to hearing your suggestions regarding that. So again, um, it's not necessarily coming up with a new idea. Uh, the two scenarios that were developed have to take into account uh, the information and data from every community within our city. And so as soon as we start uh, making tweaks or moving communities or decisions regarding designations, that does have the domino effect on every other decision that is made. Thanks, Darlene. <clears throat> and the next question was posted at 745. Is the survey and idea boards being offered in languages other than English? As there are many parents of CBE students that do not read English in a manner to understand the process and questions. And Karen? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, within our survey tool that we have right now, we don't currently have the ability to uh, translate into other languages. Uh, we have made the story, the story map is accessible and able to be reviewed in other languages if people have the uh, Google Translate widget. When it comes to the online survey and the idea boards and sharing perspectives that way, um, what we would encourage is that parents um, connect with their children and their students and work together in completing the survey. Uh, we know students often are able to navigate through the information and to help uh, support their parents in completing uh, the survey and sharing their perspectives through the idea board. So I think um, for this particular engagement, having that uh, team approach and supporting one another in, in sharing um, information and understanding and um, sharing perspectives is really important. So that is what we would encourage and we hope in the future to be able to offer uh, more translation and uh, different language just through our survey tool, we're working on it, but uh, we're not quite there yet. Thanks, Karen.
Uh, so uh, next question was posted at uh, 749. It seems Fowler has a much lower population than Pearson. What is the rationale behind removing IB and French immersion rather than redesignating them to Fowler? Connor, could you start that? Yes, absolutely. Could you tell me the timestamp on that one again? Ah, uh, yes, 749. Okay, so well, I guess they're the for the IB. I'll start with the IB. So, you know, there's already an IB program at Baker. So when we, and it's not saying which the question is not speaking specifically to which scenario. So, um, part of why we wouldn't have considered moving the IB to Fowler is there's already one in proximity, and with the French immersion program. The challenge there with the French immersion program was, as mentioned before, the low numbers. It's not necessarily the location, it's the number of students feeding into the program. So the students who are currently in French would be able to access a stronger, more robust program at Western Canada High School. Thanks, Connor. And there are some specific questions regarding IB uh, related to sports. Uh, what are the benefits of IB um, and other options? Um, I would encourage folks to take a look at the CBE website and uh, perhaps chat with the IB schools um, for, for specific information um, in that regard. Um, there is a question here. Uh, the timestamp is 748. How was it determined which enrichment programs were identified for possible changes while others are not addressed in these scenarios and are therefore slated to continue as is? If there are programs that exist only at a single school, for example, performing and visual arts employability programs, why are multi-school programs, for example, Spanish bilingual, being identified for possible closure while smaller programs continue? Um, Darlene, can I ask you to start that one? Sure, Deb. Can you remind me of the time stamp on that one, please? Yes, it's 748. 748. So currently all of our high schools do offer enrichment programs uh, with the exception of Jack James and that is either through uh, the IB program or through the advanced placement um, options. Now with advanced placement uh, students are able to uh, take one course, two courses, three courses, depending on their interests and where um, what it is they wish to pursue. Um, if they're a program. So schools that have been, I just want to make sure I'm addressing the second part of the question. Why are multi-school programs, example Spanish bilingual, being identified for possible closure while smaller programs continue? So um, actually, when you look at the scenarios, uh, one of the scenarios does uh, offer continuation of the Spanish bilingual program, uh, while the other uh, scenario does offer uh, to close the program. So when we look at uh, the PVA program um, or uh, the knowledge and employability programs that are being offered in uh, one of our high schools in particular, um, we do see uh, a larger number of students in 
both of those programs. So when we look at the consolidation of Spanish bilingual to one location, it would be a similar size in terms of, of student population that we would see at any of our other uh, schools that offer a single program. Thanks, Darlene. And just a point of clarity, performing in visual arts is not an alternative program at the CBE. Um, it is a specialization offered at a school as part of the regular program. I will pass it back to Karen for some closing remarks and next steps. Thanks, Deb. So there were some excellent questions and comments brought forward here this evening, but it's important to remember that there are other ways for you to share your feedback. So I think this was mentioned before, but uh, you have the online survey as a, a critical opportunity for sharing your feedback. Uh, there are also the idea boards where you can provide those comments to expand on uh, what you may share through the online survey. Um, so please do make sure that you uh, participate in those and, um, and ensure that you do the survey. As well, there is a student survey, so uh, whatever you can do to encourage your children to complete that. Um, the student voice is very important, important in this process, so we want to make sure that that is captured. I also want to let you know that there will be a recording of this session posted on our website tomorrow. So that is available um, for anyone who wasn't able to make it to the session um, or if there's information that you want to review uh, within the session, you are welcome to do that. Um, after this phase in the engagement process, after gathering feedback on the scenarios, we will provide one last opportunity for feedback on the proposed plan. And depending on the feedback we receive, um, we may be able to share that out for, for uh, some feedback in, in June, or it may have to wait until uh, some September. It just depends on um, the feedback and the work that is required to, to develop that proposed plan. Either way, the decision will be communicated by no later than December 2021. I know some, some people have been asking if it could be sooner, and if it's possible to do it sooner, we will, um, but definitely won't be later than that date. And um, as we talked before, the proposed plan could very well be a blend of scenarios A and B, um, but won't introduce anything um, sort of brand new at that stage. We do really appreciate your active participation in this process. We recognize that change is never easy and that we all have different perspectives and experiences that we bring to these discussions. The diversity of voices and views makes for a rich and robo robust discussion. Uh, thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts, and we hope you will continue to be involved throughout this process. Enjoy the rest of your evening and good night.